Hey, David. Welcome, and thank you so much for you know taking time out of your day and joining me today. Um, you are going to be an amazing person to feature from MCIT. So you know, I, I just know this is going to be a great conversation. So why don't we just start off a little bit of intro about yourself, some of your background, and we can and then we can dive in. Sure, Tina. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so like you said, I'm in MCAT now. Before MCAT, uh, my background's more in business. I ran a string of startups. Um, and so, so originally after college, I was a management consultant for a little bit. And then I ran a mission-focused startup. Uh, and I decided that I wanted to move into computer science, potentially AI. So I applied to a few graduate programs and MCAT was a really strong match. So I came here and this past summer I interned at NVIDIA in case you have any questions about that. That was a really interesting experience. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to answer questions about anything. Yeah, awesome, awesome, great start. So let's just start off with MCIT. Why did you choose to go to MCIT? You said, you mentioned that you did management consulting um, and then you also did some startup work which you founded yourself. So how, how does, Walk me through that. How did that become MCIT? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so with management consulting, it was really interesting because you get to have an impact in a lot of ways because you're, you're helping with the management of operations, you're helping with a lot of people focus things. But in a lot of ways, it doesn't feel like you're building anything. Um, but I, I mean, for some people they do, but obviously with consulting, like that's not the main part of consulting. You're not really adding that much value. Clients tend to have people to do that. So I moved into startups because I had startups before at university and uh, there was an important need I saw. And that was not so much financially driven, but that was impact driven. And I thought that would help. And at least with the startup I was running, what I found was I was doing a lot of things, but I didn't really feel like I was building one thing because a lot of the work was like, you know, social media here and like learning SEO and marketing. It was all really interesting. It was, you know, juggling a lot of balls, but at the same time, uh, it wasn't necessarily having the impact that I felt I wanted. And that's, I think that's pretty common. A lot of uh, research and a lot of people who've had startups will say that industry experience is a really good predictor of startup success, both in terms of money, but also in terms of impact. So um, one of my favorite books of all time is Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. It was like a really popular book back in 2011. And it talks about how Homo sapiens went from being just another species to, you know, modern day to essentially become gods, you know, making fire, flying, extending life. And he has follow up uh, that's also quite good, but a little less popular called Homo Deus. And it talks about the potential futures for next few centuries. Uh, and he makes a really good case that infotech and biotech are going to be the biggest catalysts for change this century, and not just technologically, like also socially, economically, politically. And I really want to be in the center of that to make sure that the most good can be done to most people. So a couple of days after reading that, I took the GRE and then I applied to programs. And MCT is a really cool program. I mean, I love Philadelphia as a city, but also you know, it's intended for people with non-technical backgrounds. So if any of your audience has that, like that, that's a really good mix as opposed to trying computer science pro, like graduate program and missing that. Um, but then also like the career opportunities are really good coming out of Penn. Uh, and for some of the other programs, uh, they're newer or that the information just wasn't there. And so I visited and I really liked it. Yeah, yeah. So the two book recommendations, I've also read Seeds. I better read the second one then. <laughs> so right wow, like, you were like inspired. You read the book. You were like, yeah. okay, I, I'm assuming you always kind of had an interest, but that book was something that kind of just pushed you over the edge. Is is that how how it was? I mean, you could say that, but I think that would also be me, like you know, with hindsight, like reverse engineering my story, like I did for my statements of purpose, where I was like, oh, I liked math as a kid, which was like true, but like I also haven't touched math in like a decade. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So like in a way, sure, like when I was really young, I did a little bit of coding, like at six or seven, but then my parents, when they immigrated here, they moved into IT and they saw themselves working weekends and nights and they're like, our kids will not do this. So I was like banned. But at the same time, it'd be a lie to say that like, you know, I'd been programming or I was like really math savvy or anything like that. Honestly, I think for myself and a lot of people in the program, right? Like we haven't seen math in a long time. We're lacking in a lot of areas. This might be our first time touching you know program so like i had a little bit of experience but not that much this wasn't something that came intuitively it was literally just um you know i read that book i also read i, I know we talked about before like so good they can't ignore you by cal newport and that kind of argues against the passion hypothesis and it, it creates this idea of like certain things you need a job but essentially with competence comes happiness 
uh, or it comes to film it. So it, those two books at the same time were kind of like, well, you know what? I was in my mid twenties. I could decide to do anything. And this was something I thought would have a lot of impact. Uh, obviously it's a really good career choice, especially with hindsight for a lot of different reasons in terms of flexibility um, and, you know, like the ability to use your brain and also compensation. Um, but I wasn't thinking about that too much. I just took the GRE, it worked out and I, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. What you say is really true. A lot of times, you know, we look back, we're like, oh, like, you know, I, I did this because of this reason. But honestly, at that time, it was just like, gee, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure. You know, I feel very inspired this time. I will just do it and see if it works out. And in our case, it worked out. That's why we ended up here. So, <laughs> uh, oh, okay, well, I mean, you're here. Okay, so it worked out thus far. We'll see. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, it worked out so far. You at least managed to make it into the program. And, you know, you got an internship, I managed to get a job. So hopefully this, this stays on track, you know, nothing terrible happens in the next few years. We're <laughs> yeah, we just make the first few and that's good. I, I really think that's like a really strong way. And I know we've talked before, uh, personally, just how like that is a, my approach for a lot of this, where I'm just trying to do it for, you know, three, five years and then make the decision. Because when you start doing this, it's really difficult and it's really easy to get discouraged. But I've also seen a lot of friends jump from job to job, career to career, kind of like looking for that soulmate, well, the like professional equivalent. And I just think like, it's really hard. You know, I came back from my internship flying high and I was like, oh, classes are gonna be a little bit easier. And I'm struggling so much more this semester than I was in the past. So, you, you know, it's not getting easier, but hopefully you know, three, five years, things will start clicking. Um, so you just have to, I mean, this career, I think you also have to have a really high tolerance for stress, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree with you that. You you touched on so many questions I wanted to ask you. Okay, okay, let's just go back a little bit and then we'll re-explore some of the question answers you already gave me. I wanted to know, like, in terms of, you know, MCIT, give us a little bit of background about what courses that you took. Um, I, well, I mean, you took the core classes, all of them, I assume, and then just kind of what your electives were. So that kind of gives us a context of your background and where you're heading towards. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my first year I took, yeah, the core electives, I did swap out the second system scores 595 for operating mm -hmm. systems. And that was really interesting. And that was partially because I didn't know if I wanted to do a dual degree, but if I didn't, you only really have four electives. Yeah. And I think operating systems is like really important. And that class is incredibly difficult, but it you know walks you through like threading and deadlocks and all that stuff that you're gonna need. And you also build an operating system, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, so yeah, second year, the way, I had my have my schedule set out now is this semester I'm focused on like really low level classes on like writing performance, bug free secure code. So I'm taking uh, 551, which is security, and I'm taking 547, which is software analysis. It's really focused on like compiler optimization specifically. Um, but it's a really interesting thing where some of the top tech companies like Facebook and Google, you know, they have all these tools to make sure the code doesn't have bugs and is optimized, um, but not everyone's using them. So it's really cool to see how those tools work under the hood. And then next semester it will be so much easier because I'll be back to the high level. Uh, I'm probably gonna take 555 internet and web systems and 550 databases um, to get that really high level. And I'm hoping if at some point I'm able to squeeze in between all of this, um, I took an AI bootcamp before I got here, which is, kind of like coding, but it's also different. I mean, it was in Python, but um, it's, you know, it's not the same thing exactly. And so I'm thinking about taking fast AI this semester on my own, just as a way to complement that. I think a lot of academic programs uh, in most universities, they seem to be very academic, math heavy, and I just don't have that background. But for using, you know, deep learning and AI and machine learning, uh, there's a lot of ways to do it with libraries. And so I'm looking at more practical courses that are focused on usability and less the math. Wow, you you are really are doing a deep dive there. Most people are just like, eh, it works, it's good enough. You're like, I gotta like actually understand how things work. Because, okay, for context, the classes that he just listed are elective. So they're not MCIT classes. They're considered classes for everybody in computer science. So, you know, you started coding like properly learning one year, <laughs> right? And then now you're jumping to those like actually really, really hardcore mm -hmm. classes. <laughs> so, wow, <laughs> I am very deeply impressed by that. That is something that I feel like not a lot of people have the dedication to do. So that's, and I feel like it's gonna help you in the long run. Wow, first, um, the ad drop deadline was two days ago and I'm really upset that I missed it because um, now I'm committed. But uh, it, yeah, I, I think- 
not doing that, right? I, I have to. Uh, but I mean, I think like this is the time to challenge yourself, right? Um, if you can, obviously recruiting on top, that's kind of difficult. But um, if you have the opportunity, you should. The grades don't matter as much. And it's like really important. So uh, I know you're probably going to touch on this. I'm not trying to fast forward. But like at NVIDIA, I know a lot of people I worked with, like they understood things that are really deep like lower level and it depends on what you're working it's possible you're gonna be working at in like really isolated systems where you don't have to understand the lower level things but i think it's really important to like for example if you know how a compiler works it helps like static versus dynamic problems if you have an idea of where bugs or security flaws happen uh that's like real useful because at the end of the day yes you can learn to develop you know there's a bunch of develop uh software developer boot camps and people are doing it, but the reason you say computer science is for all of that stuff around, right? Because if you want to write really good code, if you don't know that buffer overflow is something that can happen, you won't know to avoid it. And if you don't know that this is like, like how static versus dynamic, uh, like code, uh, static versus dynamic, uh, like with, with how the compiler works, I think it, it can just create a lot of problems and you won't even know they're there. And if you have really good teams, you can pick that stuff up, but this is the one time we can really explore those different avenues. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's the thing is like you can learn it now. Uh, if you go, if you do it through work, it's organic, right? So you know you might pick it up at some point, you might not, and when you do learn it, there's just always going to be pieces of it missing, so you don't really understand exactly what is happening. So yeah, like you bring up a really good point there. Now is the time to challenge yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you for your blessing. <laughs> so that actually segues perfectly. Um, you know, you mentioned. NVIDIA. So tell, tell us a little bit more about, why don't we start in terms of like your internship search and then your experience at NVIDIA. Um, and we can touch on some more topics we talked about earlier as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the internship search was interesting. Um, like I noticed, I, I, I think we had a brave classmate who shared her list of all the companies she got rejected from. Um, I think I got, re got rejected from twice as many companies as she did, probably more than like a lot of people, because I just sent a lot of applications. And honestly, like write the filtration from resume to online assessment to interview, like it's a really tough process. And once you're at the interview, that part is actually by far the easiest because they're already investing. You know, it doesn't cost the company much to give you an online assessment. Um, and still, you know, they don't do that too often. Um, so what I ended up doing was I applied a lot through Handshake. Um, I looked for opportunities on my own. And I also went to a couple of career fairs, which was really helpful. And so I got three different opportunities uh, that, I mean, I had a few online assessments uh, pretty early on and I wasn't someone who we coded super heavily. I was able to do okay in some and not okay in others. And I, I don't know um, which ones or why I, I did or did not get to future rounds. I don't remember if IBM, I, I think I did take one for them, but that was one of my opportunities that I had. They have like an extreme blue incubator. I also went through a process for Qualcomm uh, which was really great. And I met them at an LGBTQ career fair. Uh, and I, you know, talked to their recruiter and I, I gave them my resume. And then I also met NVIDIA at the Penn career fair. So I, I find career fairs and, you know, if you can get a referral, that's also helpful. I mean, people discuss whether or not that's how helpful that is or if it's even helpful, but I think it's pretty important. But generally, once you get to the interview round, it's a lot easier. Like in the interview rounds, my questions were more about like fundamentals and less leak Cody. A lot of it was uh, around like, how I think and things like that. It's so interesting talking to different people because like, yeah, like just, you know, different experiences from different people, right? Like, I, cause I also went through this. I didn't do any handshake applications. I didn't go to <laughs> okay. um, So yeah, like there you go. There's so many ways of actually- How, how do you get an offer? What? I just apply to stuff online. <laughs> oh, okay. So you just like throw like the Goldman site and like the other- yeah, yeah. I just I just applied directly. I didn't even get mm -hmm. referrals for stuff. I got like a, a couple just from people that I know really well, mm -hmm. but I didn't really focus so much on that either. And funnily enough, uh, the referrals that I got, I didn't I didn't even get a first round from those companies. Okay. It's the ones that I applied just by myself mm -hmm. that you know <laughs> I was able to get. So it's just so interesting. Like you know mm -hmm. that just that experience is so different. Recruiting recruiting is like mythical we don't understand how it works <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, i mean it's just people right like there's algorithms there's tech and but everyone's using something different i know there's been debates even this year among people who came back from internships and everyone thinks they know the golden key and like obviously certain things matter like you know if you're going to like google and facebook and amazon or or anywhere that has an online assessment like leak coding is important um but you also don't know the other pieces especially if you're coming with like a non-traditional background uh, i know one of the things 
that I, I've heard from recruiters that I did really well and was the reason I got offers from the interviews I had had to do with like communication and things that are not traditionally engineering skills. And then the questions I had, you know, other people had like actual coding questions. I had some, but the, the difficulty wasn't coding. A lot of it was just like explaining things logically. Um, it was a lot harder to discuss things like deadlocks and garbage collection and things that luckily for, I, at that time I happened to be covering in class, might be a little bit more difficult to do now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also so interesting. Like, you didn't get lead code style questions because most people mm -hmm. who do this kind of stuff, it's pretty much like all lead code style questions. And that was for me as well. Do you think it might have been because you're applying to communities such as like Qualcomm and NVIDIA? It's like very low level programming places. Maybe. I mean, it's also possible that like I didn't consider things that super difficult um, coding that maybe someone else would, but it definitely wasn't like anything like leak code. You know, I still look at leak code and want to cry. Um, I might do it for this fall and I like hate doing it. I have a very low, I'm developing a frustration tolerance. It's important in computer science. I start with a very low frustration tolerance. So like I would like leak code, I'd like look at a question for like five, 10 minutes and just look at the answer and then like read the answers and try to do it because it was just too much to do it from scratch. Um, so yeah, I don't know, because I did have a couple of like really what I consider basic things like converting a stack to a queue, um, which is like just a conceptual question and, and things like that. I know I had a question about how to debug a server that's not working. I never worked with servers, had no idea what that is. So I just used like, a it was like a consultant case interview for me. I kind of just like broke it down logically and I didn't know 90% of the potential causes of server malfunctions, but like I could logically be like, well, you know, either it's on this side or it's on the, like server side or client side and like it's either this or that and like breaking it down and it might not work for everyone that's my background like my background is in business and communication and that's kind of a rare skill in engineering but if you have background in chemistry or healthcare or you know other areas there's a lot you can bring to the table that maybe the traditional engineer wouldn't and it's not that you can like you can't fail the technical part they still have to like you have to pass it but because you're bringing something else to the table, even if you're technically moderate, if you're strong somewhere else and they see value for the team and bring you on, they will bring you on. I agree with that. Yeah, for sure. That's also, I feel like as, as non-traditional people coming in, that's really something that we need to like lean into. We need to demonstrate more because you know what? We're not going to be like, truthfully speaking, after a few months of coding, we are not going to be like one of those people who've been coding even since undergrad, right? They've had like two, three, four years of coding. Well, you got to bring something to the table. Like you can't fail the technical part, but you really try to emphasize where, where your strengths are like for like what you were saying in your case you come from a business background come from a consulting background so you really demonstrate your ability of breaking things down logically and your ability to communicate and i feel like you know for you that was something that really really like you know when people were looking at your your application they're like this is what they wanted right they're mm -hmm. like this is this is someone who is not traditional they have these skill sets that are not usually found in engineers and that's why what makes you really a great applicant and ultimately mm -hmm. You got the yeah, yeah, so it worked. I, I agree. I think people don't use that enough and people kind of try to, in a way, degrade themselves by like trying to fit a typical mold when they don't, right? Because if you're, either you're competing with other master students or you're competing with undergrads who have two or three years of experience and in multiple internships. And quite frankly, you learn so much in your internship. It's really hard to like, you know, just from academics, no matter how good of a student you are, no matter what you do as like a side project, to to compete with someone who's done one, two, three internships. So yeah. if you're able to make it to that, I mean, so uh, one of our classmates, Joseph Lu, actually asked me the other day, like how much of my resume is dedicated to like non-technical stuff. And honestly, like last year, it was probably like 80%, but I do have other things in there. I have things that show that I'm analytical. Um, I have things that show like with my startup that I can handle failure. And like, if I have a problem that's never been solved, I can find the answer. And I think those were the things I received questions about. I had some technical things in there, like projects, but aside from a couple machine learning ones for machine learning positions, I didn't receive any questions about the technical side. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. That's that's really interesting because, yeah, I also was thinking of breaking down my own resume because it was from a non-traditional background, but you just like put it perfectly. So much of my resume as well is is not technical because that's how my background is, yeah. right? But you're emphasizing what you do have. And it's also really important to emphasize why it's important in an engineering world, yeah. right? Because like, if you just are able to talk very well, so what, right? I was able to communicate <laughs> this. <laughs> like talking is great, right? But you, you really need to drive home the point why it's important as an engineer to be able to communicate well. 
but yeah, you, you cover that very well. So I'm going to stop rambling now. <laughs> um, yeah, I also wanted just in terms of your um, experience at NVIDIA, I'd love to learn a little bit more about that as well. Sure. So literally this all translates exactly into NVIDIA, right? Because first month was brutal. Um, honestly, like I was trying to learn the software, the stack. I was using languages I'd never used. I was using methodologies I'd never used. I never had experience like a continuous integration, continuous development environment. Like everything was really, it was a lot. And also this was the first year that things were remote. And from when computer science is with software development and probably most areas of tech are very mentor driven. It's a lot of learning. You actually have like an negative net value early on, not just as an intern, but like as a junior engineer for your first year, or even as a senior engineer, if you're coming on a new project for first few weeks or months. Um, so that part was really difficult. And I think why I did that made it really difficult the school year, but I would actually highly recommend, especially if someone's in a similar position, is I extended my internship as long as I reasonably could. So I did it from essentially finals in May to I have had a little overall with my academic year in September, which made the academics hard. But that four month period was really useful because I was able to learn the first month and it was kind of a disaster, honestly. And then like the second and third month, I was starting to get into the rhythm and especially the third month I was like contributing. But by that fourth month, I was essentially already an engineer on the team. You know, I had my project come out. I, uh, well, like my big, my biggest project come out because I, I worked from small things. They gave me a few small things to work on as I proved myself there, I got a bigger project. But in that last month, um, as opposed to a lot of people who were really stressed their last few weeks trying to get everything in, documented and transferred, I was able to work on improving my project, make it more useful for customers, uh, spotlighting it was getting highlighted a little bit. So like open sourcing, I was able to do a lot of things because I had those extra few weeks. Uh, and also, that's a great example, too, where my strengths came in because, uh, because they do carry, you know, your, the strengths of your background. That first month, uh, really difficult, and a lot of it was just painful, and I was honestly spending weekends into my second month, like, learning Docker and Kubernetes because I'd never worked with containers and, and all the things there and Linux uh, and Git. Uh, so just even understanding the tools that underlie my project, the basic stuff, was really difficult. But then... The second and third month, again, I was trying to force myself into a typical software engineer uh, position, and I was just focused on technical. But once my project started to take off in the last you know, six weeks, I was like leaning a lot more on the presentation and the communication and like the business logic skills because I was able to you know, really focus on showing what the value is to the business and working with solution architects and, and people on the business side. And I was able to present to a lot of people so that they understand the projects working, I was able to package and do all these things that interns don't typically do that they would seek mentorship for, but I was able to find the right people, uh, package it, deploy it, work with the legal, open source it, do a lot of these things that I was only able to do with my background. And that's my background. I, maybe some of your viewers also have a business background. Uh, but for example, that that's true, I think, anywhere, right? Uh, if you have a background in mathematics, for example, maybe you know, you have certain skills that you can actually like lean on to go more on the machine learning side or or look at models and find places to drive value. And if you lean into those, I think your internship will be so much more powerful and it's going to be really memorable because how many people can do that? Yeah. Again, spot on. Uh, let's, I actually, why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, I know that you had a blog post come out that was a pretty big deal, you guys. So, um, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that, because that really is like a demonstration of the fruits of your labor, right? Oh, and also I will link the blog post above and also below if you guys want to check that out, which I highly encourage you to. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Um, so I was pretty lucky. It's not a common thing for interns, but essentially because, again, I extended, right? So I, I had essentially... The biggest project I was working on this summer was a GPU performance profiler. So we have a lot of AI models that run on NVIDIA's inference server, both internally and externally. And I was able to get that done for my team. So I was working in healthcare AI, but it was applicable really across NVIDIA, um, especially once we made it more of a general purpose tool. Uh, and so for that, you know, that was working with a lot of teams. But one of the things there is, um, again, I... The, you know, the business background, right? So you have to like sell tools. Like a lot of engineers will work on tools. If you can tie the tools with the business value, that's even more important because uh, tools aren't just made to be tools. They're made to be used by customers and customers have reasons for using them and the business has reasons for using them. So that performance profiling tool was useful kind of like across NVIDIA and the easiest way to get, uh, you know, 
the word out was a blog. So I got permission from my mentor and then my director, and then worked with the business teams to do that. And I, you know, that was a completely new experience, have no technical writing experience. Uh, and I just kind of had to like push it out and edit it and get it out um, really quickly. So I would have time to answer questions while I was still there. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, that blog post, you know, it was, you know, it, again, it's, it was the first time I think in like over five years that, you know, an intern had published a blog post uh, as like a primary author, as a sole author. And then being able to do all that, it kind of like the success led to itself, right? Because it was, the tool was out there. But then once you have the blog post and then the open source and then people start using it and then people start sharing the article, uh, it was it was really big. I will say I also caught the blogging bug myself and I started blogging on LinkedIn Medium, which might have not been the best idea because originally I had like NVIDIA's platform. So I was like, oh, like cool, like thousands of people will be, you know, reading and sharing my stuff. Um, and now I'm on Medium. I I like made myself the editor of Why David Why, where I talk about like tech concepts. But um, I'm just sharing it on my LinkedIn now and it's not the same. Um, I'm not you know, this is like, I, I know you're quite good at, like you've learned, you taught yourself really quickly how to, you know, share concepts. And I think it's like a really useful thing. But yeah, I, I caught the bug. I'm like, oh, communication is a strength. So like, let me do this now. But mostly I write for myself at this point, because yeah, it's it's actually a lot harder. So kudos to you for what you're doing. It's, it's really amazing. Thank you. I mean, it's, I'm still learning so much right now. I literally started off like not knowing how to use a camera. So, <laughs> you know, Guys, like I have checked out David's articles and um, I will link those as well. Like just provide me with a link later. I will link them above and below as well. I really think that if you guys are interested in, in this kind of stuff, you're either transitioning to your career, we're just learning about tools in general that people are using. This is really, really helpful, especially coming from someone like David. Like he's not from a traditional engineering background. His communication skills are really his strongest points, right? Uh, we're adding on with the engineering as well, but like, you know, coming in, your communication has always been your strongest point. So his ability to communicate these two people is really, really super. So I'm just gonna Thank put that know. plug in for that. But yeah, Thank like you. congratulations again. I said this to you personally as well. Like really, it's amazing that you were able to, you were, you were able to create that blog post, right? Before that, you were able to create that tool because I saw you from the first month coming in <laughs> Like, you're like, Man. Tina, it was so helpful. Thank you. You were so helpful all summer. Tina was there for me when I was like practically breaking down. <laughs> but it's hard, like, you know, because a lot of times after people talk about, you know, like, like oh, like I wrote like 10,000 lines of code this summer. Or I did all these cool things. And you don't always get to see like, behind the veil of like really the struggling, potentially working evenings or weekends or not being sure that you could do it. Um, and honestly, like when things go well, like, you know, people talk about that, but people don't talk about all the the positions that they did not get all of the uh things that summer that they kind of that they blew uh because it, it just isn't you know we're in this it's, we're in instagram culture right you, you talk about your best side you don't talk about the worst side i will also say because I, I do want to add this as a caveat for using your skills do be careful because you can also get pigeonholed right i once i wrote the blog post i had the opposite effect where like, people were like oh have you considered technical writing like maybe that's like a good career choice for you and like i know that's not what i want to do or you know like pr product management or like going more into business with like solution architects and it's really cool to see those options and opportunities pop up and it's because you used your skills but yeah just be aware that like you should do what you want to do and work in the strengths you want to have obviously take advantage of the opportunities, especially if they're unique and they're unique to you and you know, no one else can do it. But do be careful about being pigeonholed because if you have a rare skill that's not coming among engineers, it's very possible that you will then like be asked to use that and it might not be something that is like good learning experience for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I think that's what you did really well as well. You were like, you know, I, I know that I'm good at these things and thank you for asking me. But what I'm really trying to do right now is become a great software engineer. And I will learn those things to do that. So yeah, I feel like, you know, it's the fact that you're just learning all those classes and putting yourself through that. It really demonstrates that. So yeah, like, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I showed up with like some of the list of questions I wanted to talk to you about, but you know, always with, with these kind of conversation, it, it, I just get like so interested in, in that specific person and just everything that we're talking about. So I'm just like, what, would I, what was I <laughs> going to ask you after this? <laughs> okay, let me, okay. Um, so, 
Yeah, like I guess like really the last question that I really have for you, which I think people um, who are considering MCIT, especially if they come from a background that's similar to yours, would be interested in learning about is, you know, what do you think makes a good MCIT candidate, right? And you talked a little bit about your, your own background and how you ended up in MCIT um, as someone from a business background, where there's like a few of you guys, but not that many, right? So from your perspective, what do you think makes someone a good MCIT candidate? When you say candidate, do you mean like for the program or do you mean um, like it'll be beneficial for them to come through here and they'll be successful after the program? Uh, so I, I feel like we're going to go with more like after the program because there's also unfortunately be cases of people where they show up to the program, you know, they got in and they had amazing stats and they're really, really smart people, but they didn't go through with that program. And, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons why the application process is quite rigorous because it's not for everyone. Right. So what is someone that can go through this program successfully and ultimately succeed after the program too? Sure. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And, I mean, I can also like really quickly just filter out groups. Like if, if obviously you have a computer science background or you've done a significant amount, like this is not the program for you. And honestly, the admissions committee will probably not bring you through just because it doesn't make sense for you to be here. Um, it makes more sense to go through a compu typical computer science program because like, again, your first year is like learning the foundations and you can wave out of the classes, but then you're missing the whole experience. The point is to like really accelerate like, the, the key classes from a bachelor's into a year. Uh, and everyone's kind of coming in and, and trying to do that. So let's see. So if you go through a program, I mean, you're pretty much guaranteed, like, like all the career paths are great, right? Some people become data scientists, other people go uh, to be quants, um, other people go to uh, tech firms as product managers, as software engineers, as solution architects, as a million different things. And, and you have a lot of say with that. Uh, I think if you know that you want to be somewhere within technology, like this is a good program, especially if you don't have that background, if you're trying to pivot and you want to make sure you have the foundations, because the other way to do that is to do another bachelor's and that's a lot more expensive and time consuming. Uh, so this is probably a better way. And if you jump, if you do boot camp, you're going to miss a lot of the stuff around it. So you can be a good developer. Um, and some people will, you know, th they can be engineers and like, you can, you can pick up the skills. I just think for a lot of people, unless you have like extreme amounts of independence and, and drive that that's a really hard path to pursue. Cause it's, you know, you don't get the same career fairs and same opportunities. So if you're here, I, I know I just told you a bunch of things that other people who should not be here, but again, if, if you want to be in technology, you don't have a technology background and you want to make sure that you're building a strong foundation, this is a really good place. Uh, and then you didn't ask me this, but like just general tips for being here and things I've noticed um, some people struggle with. Uh, if you have a business background like me, a lot of times in the classroom, you're kind of told like what to think or like what methodologies to use or what research to reference. Whereas like something like this is like fair game, right? Because STEM is, it's it's factual, right? It's, it's objective. It's not like what Michael Porter taught necessarily. It's uh, if you have an issue with the program, or even if your instructor doesn't explain something well, like I'm in a security class right now and we have a ton of resources, but I'm actually looking up stuff for pen testing myself. And that was this entire summer, you know, uh, my team would be like, would tell me, you know, this uses Docker and they would try to help me, but they were also expecting me to go through a Docker documentation and figure out myself. So having that mindset of being able to try to solve answers or, or solve questions yourself and, and get all of that information, I think is really useful. Um, and other thing is really just pushing through because, you know, for a lot of people, this program is incredibly stressful, uh, especially their first year, but honestly, even their second year, because then you're taking typical graduate computer science classes with some of the best faculty who literally are top researchers in this field. Uh, and it, it's quite the transition. So if you're able to, you know, work through that and at the same time, uh, have that mindset of being able to just solve problems and, uh, I know I joked about it before, but you do have to have a high frustration tolerance to be in tech. And there's different positions. I don't know. I can't say that for everything. But if you can develop that, the sooner you do it, the better. Mm. Oh, yeah. That, that last point. <laughs> I, I'm very similar to you. I think I, yeah, I might even be worse than you. I have a very low tolerance for frustration. And, you know, in the beginning, when I couldn't figure something out, it was just like, <laughs> but now I'm like, oh, you know, it doesn't work. I don't know if it's gotten better, but like, I think it's had to. I literally spent 10 hours. We have an assignment where it's like, you're, you're like hacking into code. Um, and so we have like 10 questions. And thank God I have like other people from our program in the class with me because they're all take, like, 
it, it takes us about a day to do one question. And one question is like a few lines of code, but it's like just the logic. I spent 10 hours on like two bytes, like just figuring out like where the bytes go. And having, being able to like focus in and be that frustrated for that long, like that's not, you know, that's, I, I've heard stories. I remember someone was telling me how their roommate in college, first semester of computer science, was getting super frustrated about like semicolon errors, just like finding the missing semicolons. And like, I, like we got, fr like, I'm sure you, I, I definitely got frustrated by that, but like, it wasn't enough to make me drop out. Um, and hopefully you can handle that because obviously the <laughs> bugs only get harder as you get better. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes, yeah. Well, Arma and I talked about this a bit as well. Like you call it grit, you know, that's because just from a <laughs> professor. It's it's like you can say you can be like so annoyed, so frustrated, everything is terrible, but the whole thing is like you just have to keep going, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's really in the end, that's what matters, right? That's that's yeah. where you got to where you are today as well. Like if you just in the beginning went like, Oh, I just can't figure out Docker, <laughs> <I> give up. <laughs> You know? Yeah, I, I still don't know how. I was not, like, that was not who I was as, like, a person, if we're being honest. Like, I, I solved a lot of, like, brain teaser and stuff as a kid, but, like, also the ones that got quickly, not the ones that took a while. Um, and, you know, over time, I, like, you have to develop it. I I, um, I have a blog post, like, my NVIDIA experience, but, like, in there, I call it the engineering mindset, because, like, I know there's a lot of words, like, grit and, like, tenacity, and they're so overused in the hack and I like I was trying to avoid it but like that's literally what it is you know a lot of engineers will and this isn't me for the record this isn't this is like I, I'm learning but like I will like read the book I'll like get all the context to all that stuff that's me what engineers typically do if you're trying to go that route is engineers will like you know uh you want to learn the Django or react or whatever they will like literally go they'll find a blog post with the project in react they'll follow the blog post and the blog post will have problems so they'll have to like debug it until it works and that's how they'll learn and then they'll do another blog post or another project and they kind of just like learn by doing which sounds easy but it's also every time you have a bug you have to like without understanding it, you have to go really deep until you find it and that's a lot of frustration and so i think if you can like at least adopt that's not to be your primary approach but at least adopting that approach is really useful. I think that's one of the most important things I learned this summer and I'm trying to apply it to academics. But again, I came back here and I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this, it's easy. It's, it's not easy, but like, you just have to get better at being frustrated, unfortunately. But the, the reward is you build something really cool and then you get like, you get really happy when it works. Sometimes you don't know why it works, but you get really happy when it does. <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> that reward is what you have to keep your eyes on. That's what gets you through. Yeah, and I mean, that could be something else for other people, but like, I, and I know people talk about like monies or prestige, like those things, like you'll burn out, maybe, I don't know, like, I, I, I think you would, but to some degree, like this is something you have to develop. If you're not, if you don't like solving problems or whatever, there's a lot of lucrative careers, this is a good one. But yeah, that, I know, you have to be really rewarded by like, you know, like literally focus, hyper-focusing for six hours. <laughs> stinking bit or bite or whatever or, and then you find out that like literally you were testing the wrong thing or the combo was in the wrong place and then it works and then yeah that in <laughs> itself is a reward for some people and hopefully you're able to become one of those people <laughs> you know lucrative career you make six figures coming out but when you're actually trying to fix the thing or like just do the thing that's not what you're thinking about <laughs> no. that doesn't matter does it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, I lied. I have one more question. Um, where, where are you headed now? What are you doing right now? And what are, what's your plan for a year is too long? Well, what's your plan for like the next three to six months? Okay, that's better. Recruiters would ask like next 10 years or like my team this summer is like, where do you see yourself five years out? And it's helpful. <laughs> I have no idea. I just switched careers. <laughs> three to six months. Uh, well, I mean, I'll still be a student then, so that's an easy answer. But um, right now I'm taking, like I said, I'm really hyper-focusing on like trying to get both sides of like the low level and then the high level, and then also probably AI. Um, I do see myself going back into, um, I didn't have like a machine learning role per se. I did the computer science under the machine learning, but I helped the people who were doing it. And so I see myself again going to like an ML adjacent role, probably in healthcare. It's a really, really high impact area, you know, providing health, high quality healthcare uh, and making accessible to more people or to everyone. And so I see that as like a really cool problem space to be working in. And I'm not sure. I mean, at the end of the day, right, software engineering, like you don't always, the problem space, the application isn't, uh, it, it doesn't really change the day they work. It's just like what your projects have an impact on. So I'm not sure. 
uh, feel I, I'll probably call you in a month when I know. <laughs> but right now, really just learning as much as I can because I'm here. Uh, and then once I'm out of school, hopefully the coronavirus situation will be over uh, and I'll get to like work with the team at, in an office and just, you know, live life. Probably in the West Coast, which that's the one thing they don't tell you is that like if you want to take a top tech job, you probably have to go like California or uh, Seattle or New York City. Uh, I mean, most people know, but they don't realize just how much. Uh, but yeah, sorry, that, that does not answer your question. Short answer is I don't know. <laughs> There you go. There you go. TLDR. I don't know. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. All right. So let's just do a real quick lightning round. Most stressful activity in MCIT. I want to say debugging, but it's not that. I can't even print words. It's like when you have a problem and you have no idea how to do it and you just, you like try, but you still have no idea. Because okay. like, debugging is easy. That's like, you have something working. Um, but yeah, when you're given a problem and you have no idea what to do. Fair, fair. Uh, what's your favorite book? You actually already said. So what's the book that you recommend to people? I mean, if, if you like sociological history, like Sapiens is incredible, like reframes a lot of concepts of our world in like a really good way, even like the agricultural revolution. But uh, the other book I mentioned, So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. I think uh, a lot of people in our generation switch jobs a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of issues. I, I know for a lot of people, I recommend it to it. It was quite helpful for uh, getting rid of some of that angst. Perfect. Uh, okay. When you feel overwhelmed and unfocused, what do you do? Um, I like to go outside because it's one of the few things that we still can do. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> okay. And what's your favorite classroom strategy? From the foundation, like the first six classes, right? Or anything. I know it's it's probably a toss up, and this can make me sound like I like systems, which isn't necessarily the case. Um, but like five nine three, uh, the architecture class, I think is really difficult. But like at the end, you feel the most accomplished, which I, I guess that's how hazing works, right? Like the more difficult it is, like the more accomplished you feel after. Uh, but also operating systems, same thing. You build a whole system, and I didn't realize how useful it'd be. You know, when people talk about like race conditions or, or uh, deadlocks or other things or threading like you don't learn it properly in other places and like actually having implemented it is like super cool mm -hmm. least favorite class <laughs> oh oh okay, i thought you were wait that's not fair um obviously Why? because this is like recorded uh let, let me think <laughs> uh so it's hard because the first semester you're taking like, all these courses and a lot of them like I, I need immediate application. Like, that's just how my mind works. And so, like, 592 is, like, math. And, like, it's interesting, but, like, you're not directly applying it, and it doesn't feel like it's building toward anything. So that was um, – the instructor is incredible. Arvin's really good. But uh, there wasn't as much immediate application. And then we also have the class 591, which keeps getting revamped. I don't know it in its current rendition. But um, if someone – if you have a programming background, it might be in your best interest to waive it. I didn't, but I had enough from like different things I picked up over the years that the first half of that wasn't super useful for me. It might be different for other people, but like I, that is a lot of people's experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it is still being revamped again. <laughs> as we N Notice I was like uncomfortable to give you one class I didn't like, so I gave you two. <laughs> Perfect, there you go. <laughs> all right, so that's all the questions that I have for you. Um, this was you know, it's always so fun talking to you in general. <laughs> you too. So, so now, you. now I get to ask you questions, right? That's how this works. Anytime you can ask me a question, whatever you want. Okay. For somebody who's looking to get into YouTubing or blogging or media, what's the recommended, like, fast, like, how would you fast track their progress? What would you recommend for them? You know, I don't think I have enough experience <laughs> to answer your question. I was still trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> all right. All right. Wait, one second. You've asked me questions. What, what classes I don't like. By the way, I'm sorry. I'm not going to say who the professors are. Classes were great. They were just, anyway, <laughs> least favorite for utility. Um, you asked me questions. You asked me a lot of invasive questions here. I can ask you. Okay, no, the thing is, okay, fine. I'm not, I feel like I'm just not qualified to answer that because if I knew how to do that, I would be, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out myself, okay? <laughs> uh, I guess, okay, for me, the here, one, let's yeah. say, like, the thing I've learned the most, okay, that I, ha I didn't do very well uh, my first video is how important it actually is to share it with people because you're like I made this thing I put it online I hope someone <laughs> watches it but no like nobody cares nobody even knows you made it like you have yeah. to 
be comfortable sharing that on forms of social media. And that's coming from someone that literally used zero social media. Uh, right now I use one form of social media, which is still very difficult for me to adapt to. So yeah, that's my one thing. Oh, that's good to hear because I literally deactivated my Facebook two days ago. <laughs> Sorry to anyone who works there um, in your audience, but <laughs> that, that's, that's good to know that that makes a lot of sense. And then also on behalf of Tina, if you're still watching and you've gotten value out of this, smash that like button. Oh, yes. God. <laughs> that's the thing. I'm really bad at that. I literally keep forgetting. Like people tell me, they're like, oh, you need to like tell them to smash that like button and subscribe. <laughs> and I just, you know, I just talk about my thing and I forget. There you go, guys. David said it for me. Smash that like button. <laughs> Subscribe, Subscribe the do the thing, comment, the thing, all the things. <laughs> Click on notifications. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any more questions? No, I think you you had you handled that one so well. I'm just speechless. No more questions. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much again for coming out. That was just so much fun talking with you. And just like, yeah, like it's, like I said, it's always just so much fun talking to you in general as yeah. well. Um, I will be linking everything that we talked about in terms of your, your post, uh, your blog post or in a video, as well as the Medium post above and below. Again, reminder, you guys should really check that out. David is amazing and he's also an amazing communicator. So you will miss out if you don't. Thank you so much again for coming here. I really, really appreciate it. Really enjoy talking to you. And I think this will just have so much value for anybody that's coming come from a business background or just even not coming from a business background and thinking about going to MSIT or just computer science in general. If you'd like to watch more of these videos featuring people with non-traditional backgrounds going to computer science, especially with focus on MCIT, because that's the people that I know the best definitely make sure to look out for more videos coming up. I'm making this into a series and I'm going to be interviewing for people from MCIT who come from all walks of life and their experience. So I will see you guys in the next video. <laughs>